We live on the brink every day. We stand on the threshold between this world and the next one. We live and move between the ordinary and the divine, between the mundane and the mystery. Too often, we forget to look up and see the angels in our living room. We forget that the love we give and live is a sign of eternity. God with us, right now, we forget that company is coming. Luke tells us that God's favor came to a girl, an ordinary girl. It might have been you or your daughter. It might have been the girl down the street or your grandchild. But the messenger of God came and greeted her and said, The Lord is with you. What a gift and a promise, Emmanuel. God is with us. We light these candles with peace in our hearts for the promise of proximity, the nearness of God. Even when we forget to listen, to learn that presence, God is as close as your own breath. This, in a confused and confusing world, is a peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace that knows the company is coming. I have two scriptures to share with you today. The first one is from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1 through 4, and verses 8 through 11. And this is the year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from the darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn. And provide for those who grieve in Zion. To bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of joy instead of mourning. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated, and they will renew the ruined cities they have been devastated, that have been devastated for generations. And then our second reading is Luke 2, 1 through 6, and this is one that I'm sure everyone is familiar with. It is the birth of Jesus. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So today I'm going to be talking about the wonder of a manger. Christmas means different things 
to different people. It always has. To some, the wonder of Christmas is about bright lights and Christmas trees. To other, it is about gathering with family and friends to exchange gifts. But for those who follow Jesus, the wonder of Christmas is about the birth of our Savior. And so at Christmas, we focus on the nativity scene and the manger that held the precious Christ child named Jesus. Now we have all heard the stories of mischief around this time of year when adolescents, or I assume they're adolescents, steal the figure of Jesus in the mangers from nativity scenes. For some reason, people think this is a cute and some sort of a Christmas time prank. One of the churches I previously was at had their baby Jesus stolen from the nativity twice. And they have taken to tying the figure down to make it harder to steal. Now what's surprising to me is not that someone would steal baby Jesus from the manger, but that someone would put him in a manger in the first place. What is the wonder of a manger and what can we learn from this unlikely crib that can help to awaken us to the wonder of Christmas? Now we tend to romanticize the manger, oftentimes decorating our homes and churches with nativity scenes, but the whole truth is that there was nothing romantic about the birth of Jesus. Today's scripture, Luke's gospel, gives us details leading up to the birth. We see two people, one unwed and pregnant, traveling to the small town of Bethlehem, which was far from their home in Nazareth. There was no hospitals with state-of-the-art birthing centers at that time. There was no highly skilled medical team waiting for them. More than likely, there wasn't even a midwife to assist. And we also read that there was, this was not a journey of pleasure because they were being ordered there by Caesar because he decreed that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world and everyone should go to their own hometown to register. And then Mary goes into labor. More than likely, they would have gone to Joseph's family home where there would have been room, but with all the family coming into town to register, space would have been at a premium. And add to that, that Mary was about to give birth. Joseph was Jewish, and according to Torah, or the law, Mary and everyone and everything around her would be unclean for seven to 14 days, depending on the sex of the child she was to give birth to. Therefore, the room and possibly the people present would become unclean as well. So there was no room at the inn. So being placed in a stable would have been reasonable because it was where some families' most guarded possessions would be housed, their animals. That is the most likely reason that Jesus was laid in a manger. Now we sing songs like Away in a Manger, we find ourselves drifting to a serene scene of Mary, Joseph, some sheep and shepherds maybe a cow or a camel, and we see those scenes as peaceful and quiet. But it really is a time for a reality check. It was not a romantic experience for Mary and Joseph. After all, they laid their baby in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. They must have been asking themselves, how could we have let this happen? How could God let this happen? since Mary was chosen to carry God's only son. And I often think about this myself. I mean, why would anyone put Jesus in a manger in the first place, especially God? But the reason is that it was by design. God was setting the tone for Jesus' entry or entire ministry. God wanted the whole world to know the nature of Jesus right from the beginning. And it spoke volumes about the way the sovereign ruler of the universe was going to win back God's own lost children. Not by overwhelming us with might, but by winning us with love. And for God, it was not a matter of power. God had no intention to scare us back into submission 
or to force us into a relationship. God wanted more, so much more. He wanted an authentic relationship with us, and he was willing to go to any length to help make that happen. And that's why Jesus was sent here, and that's why Jesus had to be born in such a lowly way, in a stable, and laid in a manger. Now throughout the Bible, we see God as a seeker. In John 23, we see the Father seeking. We find God scanning the earth from the heavens in the Psalms, especially Psalm 14 too. We see God's eyes running to and fro throughout the planet to find something in 2 Chronicles. We find Jesus telling us that he has come to seek in Luke 19.10. The story of the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep looking for the one that was lost. And when I hear this story, I look at myself as that one sheep. It doesn't seem as alarming to wonder why he left the 99 if you are the one who needs the help. God and Jesus are looking for ways to reach us, to reach down to us in our troubled world. And that's the wonder of a manger that God would choose to set aside God's deity and enter into the stream of human history as a vulnerable child in order to bring us back into a relationship with him. Now from the moment that Adam and, Adam and Eve rebelled against God's divine rule and humanity fell into sin, God the Father began a plan to win us back, to deliver us from evil and to save us from self-destruction. And it took centuries. God worked through many prophets and sages throughout the Old Testament. God carefully chose people who would reveal the Father's character and truth. And then when the right time came, God personally stepped into our world. Emmanuel, God with us. Now there's a story of a little boy who was sent to a boarding school in rural England during World War II. When Christmas Day came, the little boy was terribly sad and nothing, nobody could cheer him up. And when he didn't come out of his room for the Christmas dinner, the school's headmaster grew concerned and he went to check on him. Trying to console him, the headmaster asked what the boy would like for Christmas. And the boy looked at a photograph of his father, which stood on a dresser and said, I wish my father would step out of that picture. And that's exactly what happened in Bethlehem on that first Christmas night. Christ, the Son of God, stepped out of eternity. He put on human flesh and he entered into our world. Or as John describes it in the Gospels, the world, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, when he came into this world, was real in every way except that he was without sin. He had real senses. He looked upon people with compassion. He saw and he felt pain. He experienced pain and heartbreak, such as when he wept for the death of Lazarus. And he laughed. Yes, he even laughed. Jesus was fully human while still being fully God. And that means that in this humanity, he can emphasize with our experiences, good or bad, and at the same time, bring divine healing and comfort. So Jesus' entrance into our world was really not the way we would envision God coming to meet us. We see in the past that God made, made a special place when he passed Moses in Exodus 33. Here is a place near me where you will stand beside the rock. As my glorious presence passes by, I'll set you in a gap in the rock and I'll cover you with my hand until I have passed. Then I'll take away my hand and you will see my back, but my face won't be visible. We were not able to see God and live, but by Jesus taking the form of a human, God was able to be with us. And God's ways are always full of wonder. And there is nothing about the birth of Jesus that could be construed as a misstep or an accident. Everything about it was orchestrated to the finest detail. 
Jesus was sent in this humble way because God wanted us to know that Jesus' reign would be characterized by humanity. Jesus came to show us the way to live, not by being exalted, but by serving others. And throughout Jesus' life, we see him reaching out to hurting and forget, for, forgotten people, putting others' needs before his own. We see him believing the best in people. We see him reaching down to the outcast and the weeping. We see him putting on an apron to wash the feet of his disciples. And finally, we see him giving his life on the cross in place of ours for the sins of the world. Christ was determined to show the world the secret of true happiness and the way to inner peace, both of which come from obeying God and by serving others. And when you live with God's will for you, you are moving in sync, just like a formal dance with the universe as God created it. You find harmony with God's creative design, and your soul beats in rhythm with God's heart, and you find contentment. It was no accident that Jesus was born among the animals and placed in a manger. And it was no accident that Jesus devoted himself to serving others. It was no accident that he was loved by some and despised by others. It was God's plan. The wonder of a manger, it was God's plan to send his son so that we might be with God forever. In the words of the author, Benjamin Schaefer, it's stunning how approachable God makes himself. He's not hiding somewhere, concealing himself from mankind. He hasn't made it difficult or complicated to find him. It's not a special privilege for only a few select. He wants to be found. And he wants to be known. He wants to know you. In other words, God wants us to come to the manger. And let me leave you with um, some beautiful words. And this is from the Bible. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. What a beautiful picture of God's love for you and me. Will you pray with me? Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the wonder of the manger and the wonder that is Christmas. Because you came into our world in human form as Jesus to be with us, to walk with us, to teach, and to just be here, Lord. And we know what a wondrous blessing that was. Thank you so much for all that you do. In your name we pray. Amen.